55 megabytes per hour. Well, guess what? Up until recently, Apple only let you have 50 megabytes if you were going to download your game through the air. Now, I know what a lot of you are going to say. Oh, but you could always just download the game and then download more day or later. Yes. Sure you can. <laughs> And uh, you can weather the storm of one-star reviews of people saying they paid money for your game and they never downloaded it, and they just went back to uh, playing Jack Lover. I like what's in here. Fuck Jack Lover. So, um, clearly we're going to have to do something differently. So, what you can do is you can store the samples. You can store the actual instrument sounds and piece them together for your soundtrack, just like you know you were playing on a synthesizer or, or using a MIDI track. So, what does this mean? What this means is we store just the samples of the instruments that we want to play. Um, so all our all the audio data is less than a second, um, and we know the frame rate. We know where the clock is at. So what our track data can be is just the timing of when to play those sounds. So this is exactly what you would get out of the step composer. This is basically what MIDI is. MIDI, you know what? You're familiar with that. Um, so that sounds cool, right? I mean, right, that sounds great. <laughs> Except that's not. So uh, I actually implemented this, and um, I had something where it just said, OK, play this sample at t equals 2, and that sample at t equals 2. And the whole track is playing, and I played the game, and it sounded great. And then, uh, this is a true story, a bunch of us do this thing where we go to a cabin in the middle of the woods called Indy Cabin. It's not the most creative thing, but it's true in advertising. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, this guy here in Isaacson from New York, who is a musician and a drummer, comes up, and he's like, man, I want to check out John Malone. That sounds awesome. And I'm like, so proud. I'm waiting for him to tell me how great I am. <laughs> and he didn't even get to this tour. And he's like, dude, this is like glitching. And I'm like, what? There's no way it could possibly be glitching. My super beastly Mac. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, no, no, I heard glitching. And I'm like, OK. So that was the game. I fired up just the beat editor, because we had this, this editor to, to make the music that has, it's not rendering stuff, and it doesn't have the AI going, so a lot of weird things going on in the background. Nothing else is happening. It's not the garbage collector firing up. It's not a background process. And he's playing around with it. And he just made a metronome of 16 notes. It should have been like da 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 well, not yet. When you play a sample, you're not actually, it, it's not actually playing when you think it is. So our brains are signal processing machines. And when it comes to syncing up audio, your brain can detect the difference of up to about three milliseconds. OK? So if, you, if you've got a game that's going at 60 frames per second, which is what we all are in video games, that's 17 milliseconds. So even if you're locked on a constant frame rate, there's enough slop within that frame that your brain can, can notice when something's off. And it turns out when you're in Unity, and everybody in this room uses Unity, right? <laughs> <laughs> if that's triggering an update loop, you don't actually know when in that frame the update loop is going to trigger, right? Uh, so first of all, depending on what other mono behaviors are active, there's an undefined number of update loops that you've done beforehand. But even if you're very careful with your scene and it's, if the same number of update loops are coming beforehand, 
None of those other update loops execute in an unspecified amount of time. You know, you can have update loops that do nothing, and then an update loop that starts your A-star pathfinding algorithm, and, and it takes a lot longer. So even if your game is a locked-in frame rate, it can be triggered in samples from a red from any arbitrary point within that frame. Okay. The other thing is, even if you know you can architect your video, you control the order of update loops. You can say, okay, well, this update loop is going to fire the first time, first thing in the frame. The way audio hardware typically works is you have an audio driver that's looping, and every so often it's pulling for samples that it wants to play. And depending on how long that pull loop is, it can play that sound almost instantly, or it can play that sound you know, to however long that loop is, which is you know, typically around 10 milliseconds. And so even if you trigger your audio sample at exactly the right point, there could be a, a, a random amount of up to 10 milliseconds of latency, and your ear can totally pick that up. Okay, so you can't trigger samples, otherwise it sounds like shit. So what can you do? Well, luckily Unity gives us access to the actual PCM data that the audio hardware is processing. So you can go old school. So by old school, anybody who's been programming audio stuff for more than 10 years knows that how it used to work is the audio hardware basically has a rate buffer in memory. And it was always just playing from some point in that ring buffer. And if you wanted something to play, you would actually put your data in that ring buffer. And in Unity, you can essentially do the same thing. Uh, so, so first of all, does everybody understand what PCM data is and how audio data works? Uh, CM stands for pulse code modulation, meaning this acronym nowadays. Uh, basically, audio is a wave. And uh, all, all it is is sampling the magnitude of that wave at different points in time. And all raw audio data is, all the raw file is, is it saying, okay, right here the magnitude is 9, right here the magnitude is 11, right here the magnitude is 12, right here the magnitude is 13, and that's it. So, um, you often hear frequency referred to with audio, so I'm sure a lot of you guys know this, but frequency is how many of these samples we have per second. A CD is 44.1 kilohertz, so there's a reason why it's 44. <laughs> yeah, um, audio files, like they're data at 96 kilohertz. Um, and you'll notice this right here is an integer value. So often you hear a bit, where were we? Bit rate. Yeah. Bit, no, not bit rate, bit depth. So this is not bit rate uh, like when you hear um, MP3. MP3s. That's compression, totally beyond the scope of what we're talking about now. So uh, this right here, there are 16 possible magnitudes. So how many bits is that? <laughs> right. That's four bits. So a CD <laughs> is 16 bits, um, which is you know 65,000 potential amount, potential magnitudes. That's, that's often considered overkill, uh, but that's what it says. Okay, so to go to locked in groove, what we actually have to do is use the uncompressed audio data to to put together a track like this. So uh, now I'm going to show you guys code, which is what's in the handouts, because the only code in the big presentation is a really kind of nice. Woo! Anybody here not a programmer? It's like thrilling. Thrilling. <laughs> so how do we do this? How do we get, how do we create this uncompressed audio data? And this is a very Unity specific implementation. 
So uh, the first thing we do Sorry. is we create a buffer of the length that we like. We get the back. Yeah. We create a buffer of the length that we like. So by a buffer I mean, remember there were all those the PCM data was just different magnitudes at different point in time. So the way it works in Unity is it doesn't actually use an integer, it uses a float. Which actually is a little bad, but we work with what we have. Um, so that's what this is right here. So basically we're just creating an array, which is going to have all the different magnitudes in it. So this, this right here is a, it multiplies the duration in seconds by the, the frequency, that makes sense. Right? Two seconds, 44.1 kilohertz. That many. And then you'll notice there's a 2 at the end. Why are we multiplying it by 2? Well, and that's because, does anybody know? Stereo. Exactly. So we're dealing with stereo sounds, so there's a different, there's basically a different track to the left and the right channel uh, that is hard coded because human biology is hard coded to have two ears. <laughs> um, The, so, uh, well, we'll get into the order in a second. Uh, so, we have a audio clip, which is how it works in Unity. So, you know, Unity samples are audio clips, and our sample happens to be called sample. <laughs> Now, this is the kind of thing it should be in the, in the code you have there, just a, a public variable, so that in the editor, what it would show up as is something you could assign to a, an audio resource. So, okay, you assign, you assign an audio resource to that public variable. How do you actually get the data out of it? Well, audio clips have a function called get data. And what this does is this copies the data out of the audio clip into this array of floating points that you pass it. Um, the zero, which you don't have to specify, is just an index into it. If you wanted to, you can copy half of the data. Um, OK, so now we have two things. We have a, a buffer of floats, which is our output, and a buffer of samples, which is our input. So how do we get? How do we copy that sample into our output buffer? How do we composite it onto the track that we're making? We simply add the floats. So what this goes here is this goes through every single sample in the instrument that we want to add to our, to our output buffer and adds, it to the, so adds that float to the associated float in the output buffer. Uh, this is the naive way to do this, uh, and there are some problems with this, which we'll, we'll get into in a second. So what we have now is we have this PCM buffer, which is the PCM data right now just containing our one sample. Okay, so what do we do with this? So what we just looked at is this positive sample onto track is in the handout. Now we can do this to any arbitrary sample. And we can use this as a building block to essentially copy the sounds note by note onto this output buffer. What it's doing right here, by creating a two second long loop and copying you know, a sound that the start half a second and one second in and one and a half seconds in, it's basically making a 120 BPM. It's just the simplest thing I can, I can illustrate. You could use that for any music of any arbitrary complexity. So uh, what this does right here, these four calls build this PCM buffer. So now we have our buffer of PCM. 
ECM data that's our output, how would the community actually play it? Is we put that into an audio clip. And just like there's audio clip get data, there's a function that actually takes our PCM data and generates an audio clip from it. And once you have it, you can play it on an audio source. So uh, how good it works, there's an audio source, and then there's an audio clip. Audio clip is the audio data itself. The audio source is the position that something is playing from, and then there is an audio listener. Typically, the audio listener is seen is on the camera. For simplicity, you can also put the audio source on the camera. If you don't care about 3D sound, uh, you know, if you're generating audio you want it to play without any modulation, that's probably what you're going to want to do. Uh, you, set the, you set the clip on that audio source to, to what we just made, and then you play it. And in Jungle Rumble, which is you know, over the game, you've got beat loops, you can, you can loop it. Or you can actually change that data as it plays. So, uh, a few caveats. What I've just shown you is a very naive way to composite a track on audio data, and there's obvious drawbacks. So, the first is all the samples we use have to be at the same sample rate that we're trying to output at. So, we're, all, we're only dealing in the world of 44.1. Often samples are either the same memory, they're at 22 kilohertz, or they're not in stereo. Uh, yeah. What do you do about the platform that the sample rates? Luckily, you did the abstract that way for you, as long as your source data is, it exposes what your source data is. Um, now, if, this, if, the, if your source data is, is not at whatever sample rate you're using, Resampling is actually, you can do it. Uh, and I've got some pointers to algorithms on the link at the bottom of the, of the handout. It's not something you could really do at one time on most platforms. Uh, and it also significantly increases the complexity. And, you know, unfortunately, you can't do the naive thing if you want to go from, 22, from 44 kilohertz to 22 kilohertz. You can't just throw up every other sample. That sounds like shit. Uh, so, it's something to keep in mind. But you can always prepare your data to be whatever spec you want it to. So, you can work around that. Levels. When you're manipulating audio data, you have to keep in mind levels. So, when you Composite samples on by just adding the, the values, by adding the magnitudes, there's a chance they'll add up to something greater than one. Now the problem is, audio hardware is designed by Nigel Tufnell of Spinal Tap, does not get to <laughs> <laughs> Instead, what happens is you saturate and it sounds really bad. In real life, you can generally avoid that by having your samples of an acceptable enough magnitude that it won't, you won't get an unreasonable amount of saturation. You can always scan for it, and if, if you're getting too much, you can lower the magnitude of things that you're compositing together. Uh, in my experience, this hasn't been, a, uh, I can handle this by controlling the levels of the samples themselves. Uh, there's also the issue of dynamic range in a song. So, sometimes when you're listening to music, there are quiet bits of neural mountains. And sometimes you're listening to Skrillex, <laughs> and the quiet bits are just as loud as the loud bits. <laughs> so, what you can you know, if you look at a waveform of the whole song, or so, what you can actually do is you can compress it so that the quiet bits get louder and the loud bits get a bit quieter. And by compressing, I'm not talking about <coughs> compression, I'm talking about dynamic range compression. Uh, just have to stand over, over the term. This is really an artistic choice. Um, 
there's passionate advocates of all audio being this, in a song being the same loudness and of the song having quiet bits and loud bits, so this is up to you. Um, the other problem you can have, if you think about it, if you're adding waveforms, let's say they're the same note and the same frequency, but what happens if piece up one thing you're adding will respond to the drops on the other thing that you're adding? You get what's called phase cancellation. And this is really bad. Because you'll add all these sounds and you'll get you did silence. There's no real good way to deal with this. You can detect it and you can often shift things slightly and avoid it. Or not use things in exactly the same pitch and avoid it. Uh, this is really something it's it's better to engineer out with the simple thing. Okay, then, and it's a little tough to do at, at runtime, time, depending on how long your samples are. But that's definitely like a more advanced application of this thing. Okay, so um, doing this at runtime on my Mac, it's almost imperceptible. But just that last thing that I showed you, adding when I when I ran the sample code that's on there. Um, my Nexus 5, which is actually you know, a pretty nice device, adding those four samples took 10 milliseconds. Which, okay, so it's a hundredth of a second. It doesn't sound like a lot, but remember, if we're doing this, the, the, the point of this talk is runtime remix, and if you're doing this locked to 60 frames a second, where each frame is 17 milliseconds, you can't spend 10 milliseconds on real time audio. That would be real time. So, there's a few naive things that this does, which, which you can actually improve and make it work in real time. The first is you don't have to do everything at once. What I actually do in Jungle Rumble is I divide it up into slices. And so when I'm building a, a beat loop of, of, say, two seconds, I can do it one tenth of a second at a time and then spread it across multiple frames. There's not the code to do that in there, but I'm the other thing is this code does something very stupid, which is it calls that get data from the audio clip every time it adds a sample to that buffer. Obviously, that's dumb because in a modern architecture, accessing memory is the slowest thing possible. And accessing memory from some arbitrary audio hardware to pull it into RAM, let's even down. So, first of all, there's no reason you can't just get all that data at startup time and then access it as you need to be. The other thing you can do, which is an optimization, is if you know you're adding the same sample at multiple points in the timeline, you can actually only loop through the sample once and just add it at multiple points in the output buffer simultaneously. I found that to be more memory efficient, or more time efficient. So that's that. Um, so we all know dynamic soundtracks are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff online. System, but I didn't realize it was an actual drum machine that he sort of used to, to trigger the sample. So I thought that was neat. Um, I definitely want to try and look, you know, this is nice. Like he actually gave us, like, you know, look at this, like a little bit of a rundown of like the example code and whatnot. I thought that was pretty neat. So definitely what I want to try and do is look at this code and look at, look at more what I can do to implement the audio myself. Because usually as a 
influencer, I skip the programmer and the audio, and I'm like, you, cool, you do your thing, man. But if I can kind of learn how to do this, you know, I could have a little more management in the code, but also just I can understand what's being implemented in the system. It helps with communication, helps with the workflow. So that's that's what I got out of this. Um, it's definitely a butt kicker. It's like, okay, you know, I quite frankly only understand so much of this. You know, Trevor was a good speaker, but part of me I know now is like, okay, like, how do I build these arrays? How do I build these systems to actually work with the music I'm making? So I got that out of this, and uh, yeah, this was really nice. So I'll probably come down to the next one. Hi, my name is Ray Briarly. And I'm Will Briarly. And we're from uh, Soda Drinker Pro. And uh, as you may know, if, you, if you've played the game before, uh, you, you might know that we've spared no expense at making the most dynamic music for our soda drinking simulations. But we actually came here tonight to learn from the uh, wonderful Trevor Stricker to uh, uh, learn how to make our, our audio better. So, uh, uh, and here... Here's a little bit about how you make your audio better. It's a lot of it, it's, most of it's on here. But essentially, the idea is you want to, instead of having a, a big long sample, you want to have a whole bunch of little samples and, and load them up dynamically and put them into your game dynamically and use your code. Uh, and it sort of works a lot like MIDI. Uh, and it gave me a lot of really good ideas and I'm psyched to, uh, to kind of use them.